Okay, so um, at this point, we're now going to move on from uh, state-space models to hidden Markov models. And if this yeah goes away, all right. So I'm going to shut the door again. Okay. So um, you'll see as we kind of move forward that hidden Markov models are very similar to state space models. And actually, they are like a subset of state space models, whereas state space models are more generalized. <clears throat> so, again, what is a hidden Markov model in this case? So, I'll go through kind of the same process. So, there's a recent review paper. Um, that's really good. So if you're interested in him Markov models, I recommend looking into that by Micklintock and colleagues a couple of years ago. Um, and they define states or hidden Markov models as a special class of state space model with a finite number of hidden states that typically assume some form of Markov property and a conditional independence property. Um, so basically it's a state space model where there's a discrete finite number of states. A state space model typically assumes that there's some continuum. It's like we were showing before, there's that gamma parameter and it assumes it's some value between zero and one, but you don't define like a specific discrete number of states. <clears throat> but th again, this conditional independence property pops up where based on this diagram, um, it's from that same Patterson paper, but instead of state space models or in Markov models, the observations, so in this case, this is what's labeled ZT or ZT minus one, ZT plus one, um, are conditionally independent of one another, <clears throat> conditioned on these hidden or latent states. So there's no like state process that's then impacting the location process at the next time, which then in turn impacts the observed um, process. It's, it's a little bit different. And in this case, the hidden process are these behavioral states as it's labeled here for S, but the observed process isn't the locations anymore. In this case, it's some other movement variables that are of interest. So common examples that are used are uh, variables such as step lengths and turning angles. So just describing um, this, the distance from one point to the next points, and then the angle formed by two different consecutive steps. <clears throat> Another good paper that if you're interested in this field, you should look into is uh, by Langrock and colleagues, 2012. And they define this as a discrete time hidden Markov models achieve considerable computational gains by focusing on observations that are regularly spaced in time. Um, again, focusing on this like natural discrete time property and for which the measurement error is negligible. Meaning if you have Argos telemetry data, that's like a no-go here at least first needs to be or processed by a state space model and then could subsequently be analyzed by a hidden Markov model. And these conditions are often met in particular for data related to terrestrial animals, like I mentioned previously, so that a likelihood based hidden Markov model approach is feasible. And in general, likelihood based <clears throat> uh, approaches such as like frequentist approaches, maximum, maximum likelihood estimation, typically are much faster than Bayesian models. So this makes it potentially more accessible um, and to be able to analyze your data more quickly compared to Bayesian versions of these models. Um, a, another paper by Patterson from 2009 and colleagues um, state that hidden Markov models provide a statistically rigorous framework for incorporating covariates for allowing for the autocorrelation commonly encountered in animal telemetry data and for making inferences about behavioral states. So unlike kind of what we saw initially with the, at least the version of the state-based models we ran. Um, this talks about incorporating covariates into the estimations of behavioral states and accounting again, specific or explicitly for this autocorrelation in the data set due to this Markov property, which is also found in state-based models. Um, but like I mentioned briefly with that uh, move persistence mixed effects models package, MPMM, um, that allows you to include effects of covariates on your state space model after the fact. Um, if you wanted to include it as part of the estimation process in a single stage, you would kind of need to do some custom coding of your own because there's no current, at least our package that, that allows you to do so. <clears throat> 
Okay, and the last definition by Patterson and colleagues from 2017 is that for hidden Markov models, one typically considers bivariate time series comprising step lengths and turning angles, regularly spaced in time and assumed to be observed with no or ne only negligible error. So again, this is primarily why um, up until very recently, most people that used hidden Markov models only did so on terrestrial animals because the GPS tags typically have very little or negligible error. Um, and if you're analyzing tracks from marine animals, there's going to be a ton of error involved. Um, therefore, hidden Markov models wouldn't be useful. Um, <clears throat> so it's basically a subset of state space models. So if we look at this table um, of what are categorized as latent variable models, like I mentioned before, latent meaning unobserved or hidden. Um, we can look at these this in two dimensions, whether um, it's continuous or discrete in like the time component, um, as well as whether there's temporal dependence or temporal independence, um, as shown on that first column. So looking at that first row with temporal dependence, if it's continuous, then a continuous state, so continuous behavioral states in this case, um, you would want to use a state space model. And if there's temporal dependence, so it has this Markov property, meaning it, it's only reliant on the previous, what happened on the previous time step. Um, if there are discrete or finite states, then you would use a hidden Markov model. Um, going to the bottom row for temporal independence, that means that all points are basically independent of each other. They're not dependent from the, the first time point to the last time points. They all are assumed to just be. Um, so for a continuous state space, so continuous range of behavioral states, this is often referred to as continuous mixture models. Um, and by comparison to the right of that, if there are a discrete number of states, then this would be called a finite mixture model of some sort. So again, what we'll be covering in this set of slides is hidden Markov models. So there is temporal dependence um, in that at time t, the states, the hidden states is only dependent on the behavioral state from time t minus one, not t minus two, not the future states, um, although there are things such as uh, hidden semi-Markov models that account for different time lags, which we won't be covering. Um, but hidden Markov models only rely on the previous state for the estimating the current one. And then um, in the next topic, the non-parametric Bayesian modeling, one of the types of models I'll be covering is actually some form of a finite mixture model um, in, in its estimation, but it's a, a Bayesian non-parametric model. And this is a, a nice figure from that Micklin talk paper showing basically the different ways that hidden Markov models can be used in ecology specifically. So that first column, it's showing the observation process. Um, well, this first row that's all in green. So this observation process can include data such as capture recapture data, DNA such as eDNA, telemetry data, point counts, presence absence data, or even abiotic variables. And these can be related to the underlying state process that's hidden um, at these different levels of organization. So going from individual level to population, to community, all the way up to ecosystem level. Um, and then breaks these down into different kind of subgroups or topics. So there's like existential, which means whether the individual is either unborn or alive or dead. If you look at the population level, it could be estimating abundance. Community level could be biodiversity. Um, so there's all these different things you can estimate depending on the level of interest and what general topic you're focused on. Um, but we'll be focused on this bottom one for spatial um, and then estimating uh, behavioral states. So unlike the, the state-based models that basically are using these differences in, in two locations subsequently throughout time, we're estimating a single velocity. Uh, hidden Markov models can use a any number of movement variables essentially that you provide it. So there's a lot more customization involved. Um, and a lot of this hinges on your ability to choose variables that essentially define the, the tracks, the shapes of these tracks or different characteristics of them. 
um, that also you think are going to distinguish different behavioral states. So you need to come in with some a priori or like domain knowledge that's going to inform what what different states you think are present. Um, so if you don't know anything about the animal, you might be able to get away with some of the defaults like using step length and turning angle, but it's a lot more informative to potentially include other variables as well um, that inform different behavioral processes that you're actually trying to estimate without going in with no knowledge at all. Um, so I'm highlighting some common uh, variables that are often included uh, for this kind of diagram of a track. So we see in purple um, bivariate positions or their increments. So the position process itself, um, kind of like that first difference for that state space model or increments in this case, velocity, which is labeled here in purple as this purple arrow. Um, that could be one movement metric or variable to include. Um, additionally, you could use the distance between successive observations, such as step lengths, which are really common. You can use also the compass direction, just where it is from zero to 360 degrees, um, north, south, east, west, everything in between. And this is often referred to as the heading or the bearing. You'll see that here in orange, that up should be north, down is south, east is to the right, west is to the left. So whatever this angle is, you're always referring to this absolute angle. Whereas the fourth metric here is changes in direction between successive relocations. So this is like a relative angle between successive steps. And that's shown here in red, the turning angle. So it's this angle between two steps. Um, and these two variables, step length and turning angle, are often used together. Um, so you often wouldn't see like these two variables plus one of these others, just because it's like somewhat redundant to, to include those. Okay, so I covered process models previously for, for the state space model topic. Um, so what process models are used for hidden markup models? And like I mentioned with some of those definitions, they almost always use discrete time approach because they assume implicit or explicitly that you have a regular time series. So naturally, <clears throat> you're basically enforcing this discrete time model. Um, and a lot of times they also typically use a correlated random walk by default. Uh, more recently, other options have started to become available. So you might be able to use a random walk or a biased random walk. So again, biased random walks targeting either being attracted to or repulsed from a given location that you would pre-specify. Um, so let's say there's like a nesting site that a bird or see some, some species always returns to after going out to forage. Um, there's also biased correlated random walks that include this directional persistence um, compared to just a simple biased random walk. And then there's also continuous time implementations that have been more recently developed um, of hidden Markov models. So it doesn't necessarily require or um, assume that the, the time series has to be regular. But these, since they're relatively recent, not many people are using them because they're not quite as accessible yet. Um, and this figure to the right showing a, another figure from this Micklin talk paper, where let's say um, you're collecting accelerometer data from a tagged animal. And so you have a triaxial accelerometer it has changes in the X, Y, and Z dimensions. So this is showing accelerometer data from let's say the X dimension. And then it's estimating behavioral states based on these changes over time. So this middle row is showing the histogram of these values of this change in the X axis. And then these smooth density plots that are colored differently represent the estimates of the distribution per state. So showing what states are characterized by what accelerometer values in this case. Um, then we have a transition matrix defining how it switches among states here. And then beneath that is the annotated time series of this accelerometer data. And at the very bottom, kind of uh, what those behaviors might actually be if you were to map that onto what this bird in this case was actually doing. So again, very similar to state-space models. So now we're gonna break down kind of the components of a hidden Markov model. Um, so the, there's three components that I'll be discussing. The first one being the initial state distribution, which is going to be abbreviated as Delta. 
So this defines the starting probabilities for each of the n states. So if you have, let's say, two states that you are estimating, let's say a okay, ARS, like area restricted search state, and a transit state. For the initial state distribution, you would tell the model what you think the probability of being in each of the states would be, and those need to sum up to one. So maybe there'd be a 75% chance of being in the ARS states and 25% chance of being in the transit state. The next component is a state transition probability matrix, often abbreviated as TPM, or also this uh, upper case gamma that's in bolded, representing a matrix. Um, and this defines the probabilities of remaining in or changing behavioral states. It's like we have that alpha matrix for the state space model, where it's the probability of changing from one state to another or staying in a single state. It's the same thing here, except it's called gamma. Um, but it essentially has the same meaning. But instead of just having like the two states for the state space model, this could be two states, three states, five states, 10 states, although I don't know how useful that would be. Um, but this breaks it up even further into a greater number of states potentially, if that's of interest. And then the last major components are the state dependent distributions. So unlike what you use for state space models, where you just have this index for a gamma essentially, or it's either close to zero or close to one, or close to a value like one or two, depending on what state it might be in. Um, for hidden Markov models, you're actually characterizing the distributions of each movement variable and using that to characterize what each state is doing. Um, so it's definitely a different process, and I think you can almost kind of get more from it in terms of how you're interpreting your, your results. Um, so in this case, this like state dependent distribution function. So think of it as like a probability function um, is being represented by this function f i, f sub i, and then z t is that state or um, the distribution. So this defines distribution of data streams characterizing each state. And to show the the likelihood formula, again, I'm going to break all these equations down, but just to give like the overview. Um, we have this calligraphic L and then like showing HMM at the top. So we're estimating a likelihood for a hidden Markov model. And all of our unknown parameters are just labeled theta. So that's what's shown in parentheses there in the top row. And then this is equal to essentially this hidden state dependent distribution process. But if we break this down further, we can start doing summations over the different states we're trying to estimate where um, these state dependent distributions are dictated based on the actual probabilities of observing these states over time. And then ultimately this last row is kind of breaking this down at its most granular and including things like the initial state distribution. And then the probability distributions for your movement variables such as step lengths and turning angles. So for now, we're going to focus on this overview, and then as we kind of dig into these details, we'll eventually um, get a better sense of how this fits together. So we have our model parameters, generally all collectively labeled theta, and then our realizations of state-dependent process, um, where T time is in, so that, that E looking symbol means it's within this time interval of one to T, capital T. So that's the, the last time point. And then um, this function of S, so the, uh, again, this is the probability of being in a behavioral state S at a given time T. All right, so focusing on the initial state distribution, um, I'm gonna show this all for an example, given like a two state hidden Markov model, um, but just assume we can use essentially any number of states here. This could be three, four, five, et cetera. Um, so again, we have a row-wise vector here for delta. So our first element is uh, the probability of being in state one at time one. And then the next is probability of being in state two or state two at time one. So the subscript one here is indicating the time t equal to one and just showing the probability of being in each state. So yeah, the one and the two are just indices or placeholders for which state you're in. And we also need these to sum up to one. So if there's 
two states, three states, whatever, um, all those need to sum up together to equal one because it's a probability. All right, so that was pretty easy to follow, I think, but this one might be a little more complicated. So moving on to the state transition probability matrix or TPM. Um, so gamma here, our bold capital gamma is representing the matrix, which you can also refer to as gamma ij, similar to what we saw alpha ij for the state space model, which is this matrix here. So since there's two states, it's a two by two matrix. If there were three states, this would be a three by three matrix and so on. It's a square matrix of the dimensions of your number of states. Um, so gamma ij is the probability of switching from state j to state i. So again, i is representative of the state you're switching to, j is the state you're switching from, regardless of whether the same or not. So gamma 1, 1 is staying in state 1, probability of staying in state 1. Gamma 2, 2 is the probability of staying in state 2. Gamma 1, 2 is the probability of switching from state 2 to state 1. And then lastly, gamma 2, 1 is the probability of switching from state 1 to state 2. So essentially identical. But the wrinkle that's thrown in here, as I show beneath, is that we can also estimate gamma for each point in time, t, um, and relate that to environmental covariates. So we didn't really discuss how you would incorporate environmental covariates or variables within a state-based model, but the way that it's typically done, or one way it can be done um, for a hidden Markov model is essentially to say that each of these elements, each probability of changing from one state to another or staying in a state is basically coming from a multinomial logistic regression. So if you've worked with the logistic regression before, it's essentially this binomial or Bernoulli process where there's this probability of being in one state or another. So it's two discrete states and you're trying to estimate the probability of which one you're in. Um, once you get beyond two discrete states or whatever it is, um, groups, you move into, instead of binomial, multinomial process. So multinomial just meaning more than two. Um, so this could be three or four, et cetera. Um, but this would essentially use a, this multinomial logist or multi, yeah, multinomial logistic regression and this link function. So we're exponentiating. So taking the natural log, um, or not natural log, but exponentiating this natural function of eta ij. So it's e raised to eta ij here. Um, and on the bottom is essentially the same thing, but instead of j, it's k. And um, we're summing over all possible states. So instead of there just being two, we're assuming the probability for up to n. So this could be three or four or five. And um, eta ij, I'm not going to get into actual like defining this model, but this is essentially just like a linear regression. It doesn't have to be. You could include like splines on here if you're interested in doing something more like GAMS, um, where you have this nonlinear. Uh, basically fitting of this model, but this is how you would incorporate the effects of covariates that impact the probability of exhibiting one state or another or transitioning from these states. So yeah, again, the multinomial logit link function, and then yeah, incorporating the effects of these covariates. And then our last component, our last piece is state dependent distributions. So, ZT here is just a realization of the state dependent process at time T, which is essentially whatever movement variables we're analyzing. In this case, we're using these variables LT and phi T, where LT is the state dependent step length and phi T is our state dependent turning angle. Um, so you could have more than just these two. You can have variables that aren't these two this is just showing a common example of what's typically used for um, hidden Markov models. So moving on to kind of this larger uh, kind of equation here, expression. So at the beginning, like I show here for this uh, bullet, um, F sub i z t is just this symbol for the probability density function in state i. So 
probability density functions are just probability distributions for continuous variables. This is like a normal distribution, a gamma distribution. Um, there's, there's other ones, uh, log normal distribution. And then there's probability mass functions, which assume that there's like a discrete number of, of groups. So the Bernoulli or binomial distribution, a Poisson distribution, a multinomial or categorical distribution, um, but it's some parametric distribution defining the shape of that variable. Um, so that, that's essentially what this is representing. And we see that this is equal to uh, F of ZT given, so vertical bar, ST, the state at time T equal to I. Um, so for each realization of these step lengths and turning angles in this case, we're assuming that they are different based on whatever behavioral state you're in at time T. And if we move even further, we can break this down into, um, instead of just ZT, this is again, our step lengths and turning angles at time T, given the behavioral state at time T is equal to I, and I could be one, two, three, however many states you're estimating. And then ultimately it could be thought of as this product of the probabilities of step lengths and turning angles for that behavioral state. So again, labeling LT is our step length and T, uh, phi T is our turning angle. And this is going to be uh, different per behavioral state. So um, in this case, this is like our distribution. This is defined by a given distribution that we are going to tell ultimately in R the, the code or the functions to use to characterize a given variable. Um, so for step lengths, the most common distributions that are often used are a gamma distribution or a Weibull distribution, which is less common used in most other ecological analyses. Um, then for phi t here, for our turning angle distribution, um, since that's constrained between negative pi radians and pi radians, so going from like negative 180 degrees to 180 degrees, where zero is in the middle, um, you typically use like a wrapped distribution, um, meaning that things at the ends are closer to each other than things in the middle necessarily. So negative pi and pi both represent 180 degrees if you were to wrap them around into a circle. Um, so different distributions that are used for that include a von Mises distribution or a wrapped Cauchy distribution. Those are typically the most common. Okay, so returning back to this overall kind of expression or formula, we define the small pieces again. Again, we have here delta um, at time one for behavioral states, each of the behavioral states. Um, so we have that vector of those probabilities. Then we have our uh, state dependent step length distribution. Again, also our turning angle distribution and then the probabilities of transitioning from one state to another state. So these are all grouped together and we have a bunch of products and then we take some um, summations over these different states as well. So these are all the different kind of overall pieces that would essentially represent our process model compared to a state space model. All right, so like I mentioned, uh, the common probability density functions or PDFs for movement variables for step lengths. Um, step lengths have to be positive. They have to, an animal has to move at least zero, if not more than zero, it can't be negative. Um, it's a real number, so it's, there's no um, imaginant imaginary numbers here, um, and it could take any real value. Um, so it can be like a fraction or some sort of, it doesn't have to be an integer necessarily. Um, and it's right skewed typically. So there's a greater probability of having smaller values than larger values. Um, and again, gamma and weighable distributions are most common to characterize this variable. Whereas for turning angles, these are also real values, but they're constrained from minus 180 degrees to positive 180 degrees or negative pi to positive pi. Um, and these are represented often by von Mises or rap Cauchy distribution. So an example shown on the right um, shows two different behavioral states. 
So we have exploratory and encamped. Exploratory is that solid line, and encamped is the dash line. And the number of like kind of uh, grade lines show the number of different individuals that were fit separately, whereas the darker black line is the like, overall population average. Um, so we see that for the exploratory, that the distribution is more right skewed than the encamped, because encamped meaning that it's staying put more often, the step lengths are smaller. For turning angles, we see that with zero in the middle and then negative pi on the left and positive pi radians on the right, that um, the exploratory tends to move at about zero radians, or basically moving in a straight line, whereas the encamped states has peaks at negative pi and positive pi, indicating that it is basically turning around a lot. It's going 180 degrees either to the left or to the right. Um, so this is often what you might see when you're distinguishing between two behavioral states, one where it's moving at longer distances and straighter versus another that's moving shorter and turning around. Um, and something I'm not going to be really covering today, but that I just want to mention that it exists are hierarchical hidden markup models. So unlike thinking about hierarchical state-space models, if you've used those before where you're trying to estimate a population average um, in relation to random effects on the individuals, this is taking the use of hierarchical, hierarchical in the sense of time. So maybe you estimate step lengths and turning angles at every half hour. But then maybe you have an accelerometer on your tag as well, or on the animal, that's collecting data multiple times a second. So maybe like 10 hertz, so 10 times a second, it's collecting data. So the time scales are so different that they can't be used to essentially match up to each other without doing this other kind of structural change within the model. Um, so we see here in this top row, we have a fine scale observed process represented by the Y star. And then we have this core scale process in the bottom just by Y with subscript T. So this is maybe our like step lengths and turning angles on the bottom, which are coming from this hidden state process. But then within each of these coarser states, each one can be broken up into fine scale states, which then are um, used to impact reflect the fine scale observations. So let's say that's our accelerometer data. So this is how you would relate two different uh, data streams together that are not being estimated at the same time scale. Um, so one way to visualize this by this nice plot from Glennie and colleagues this past year um, shows these core scale states in the bottom row here as either red or blue. And each of these uh, intervals represented or separated by like a vertical bar um, represents like a one hour period. Whereas above this, in these different shades of red and blue, this is the fine scale behavioral states estimated by this hierarchical model. And these are essentially accelerometer data that are collected every second. Um, so we have behavioral states estimated every hour and then also every second. And at this finer scale, we can get at more nuanced behaviors. That's why there's these different shades of red or blue. Um, but if we only estimate at this core scale, we only have these like broader behavioral states that we can just group into like encamped versus exploratory instead of resting versus foraging, for example. And then another really nice example from Sidro and colleagues this past year as well. This is looking at a data set of ORCA uh, movements. And they show for accelerometer data in this one axis at the top, there's two dive types. So each dive is separated by one of these black vertical lines um, and they're color coded here. So dive type one is in blue and dive type two is in orange. And that's looking at our coarse scale behaviors. Then within each overall dive are sub dives. So if you go to the second row for this accelerometer data, we have each of these dives broken up into different um, fine scale behaviors. So some are kind of these turquoise colors that's dive sub dive state two, some are purple, sub dive state one, and some are yellow, and that's sub dive state three. And then if we look at the impacts of depth, we see um, 
these changes as well over, over time on the X axis. So things like this that are really cool to look into, but might not always be accessible or out there. Um, so if you have a data set that does have some process like this, this could be one way to account for all of your data without having to analyze them separately. So methods to fit hidden Markov models. In general, maximum likelihood estimation is the most common, at least for behavioral state estimation. Um, if you're doing other stuff with hidden Markov models like population dynamics, um, maybe uh, a Bayesian approach might be more common. Um, but in general, Bayesian methods for animal movements, models of hidden Markov models are less common in general. Um, so there are readily available functions to fit animal movement models. And these are typically done at least originally with the move HMM package, which was released in 2016 by Theo Michelot. Um, but then more recently in 2018, the momentum package was released and that provides a lot more options for ways to run a hidden Markov model. So in general, that's kind of what is being used predominantly in the field right now. And then as of, I think a couple months ago, um, Theo Michelot uh, announced the release of a new package called HMM-TMB. So it's using instead a Laplace approximation via the TMB package like foie gras to estimate the parameters of the hidden Markov model instead of maximum likelihood estimation. Um, so if you're interested in exploring that, those, those options are available. But I won't be covering that today. I'll be sticking with the uh, momentum package. Um, and then if interested in making comparisons among available R packages for running hidden Markov models, I would recommend looking at table two of that Micklin talk paper. Um, but the package is shown there primarily for like creating your own hidden Markov models, not using something that's like able to be used out of the box. Like you need to define your own process model essentially. Um, and again, here are some motivating examples. So this is a paper from DeRuder and colleagues, 2017, looking at, I think it was blue whale responses to anthropogenic noise. And they're using one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different movement variables. Um, where each time interval is assumed to be like a single dive. So they're using things such as dive duration, post-dive surface duration, the maximum depth, the number of lunges, like feeding lunges, uh, the step lengths and turning angles, as well as the variance of the heading. Um, and they estimated three behavioral states from this. Um, so instead of just having the single index, again, from zero to one, you have these different distributions for each movement variable um, attributed to each behavioral state. So then you can look at the distribution and then from that, again, here it's just labeled state one, state two, state three. You would try to use these distributions to like, name each behavioral state on your own, given your domain knowledge of that species. Another example is um, from that Talk michelot paper in 2018 that's introducing the momentum package. And that's showing this loggerhead track here I showed before um, in relation to this ocean advective current field. And it's basically looking at the impact of these ocean currents on the probability of changing these behavioral states. So from transiting to area restricted search. And then another example is um, this paper by Grecian and colleagues where they're looking at seabirds and um, basically relating these estimated behavioral states as they're leaving this colony to go forage out at sea. And they're using this finite size Lyapunov exponents, which is an indicator of essentially mesoscale conversion zones. So areas of high productivity that they would likely feed at. Um, and these areas that are darker gray, meaning this higher um, value of this variable indicate that there's a greater likelihood that there's pro higher productivity and they tend to be feeding on some of these like higher uh, valued areas on these edges, basically. Um, so you can, you can do things like this as well. That seemed pretty cool. And lastly, uh, from a paper by Theo Michelot in 2017 and colleagues showing um, these tracks from Southern elephant seals, and they estimated four different behavioral states 
So they're defining these inbound and outbound movements from this colony in Kerguelen off of Antarctica, um, as well as searching and foraging defined by this yellow and red color um, once they reach the coast of Antarctica. And you can see this time series here where green is the outbound track, purple is the inbound track to the rookery or the island, and then everything in between is foraging or searching. All right, so with that, let's, uh, let's do some modeling. 